Hello everyone, welcome to another day of learning. So today we will talk about our third lesson that is the self as a cognitive construct. We have four objectives for today's lesson. Number one, to explain and elaborate concepts and processes on cognition, memory, and intelligence. Number two, to analyze and demonstrate how cognition, memory, and intelligence are manifested in various aspects of their life. Number three, identify the principles of cognition, memory, and intelligence present in their own lives. And number four, discuss the factors that influence the learning process. Let us define first the significant terms in this lesson. We have cognition. According to Ashcraft and Radvansky, it is defined as the complex area of mental processes involved in remembering, perceiving, thinking, and how these processes are employed. Cognition is also one umbrella term to cover all higher order thinking. Its main function is to take in information, analyze it, and process it. Another significant term is memory. It is a faculty of mind through which information is acquired and retained for later use. Human memory is also limited and selective. It selects information to be retained and discard those that are deemed irrelevant and useless. Our memory functions in three levels. These levels are sensory, short-term, and long-term. Sensory memory is the level that allows information from the external environment to be perceived by an individual through senses. Basically, we have five senses. Those are sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing. Usually, our senses perceive chemical and physical stimuli. However, not all stimuli are perceived by sensory memory. The mind only selects information which are useful for the immediate future. It is then transferred to the short-term memory. Short-term memory, on the other hand, is where information is temporarily stored. It is also where information is simultaneously remembered and is in readily available state. Typically, the information is stored from 10 to 15 seconds up to 1 minute. Short-term memory can only store 5 to 9 items, after which the information is discarded if there is no conscious and deliberate effort to retain it. However, when there is a deliberate effort to store information and is done consistently and with practice, then this information is transferred to long-term memory. Information stored in long-term memory is often permanent and it allows for repeat retrievals across situations. And the amount of information that can be stored in this level is limitless and immeasurable. Intelligence is an individual's capacity for understanding, learning, planning, and problem-solving with logic, creativity, and self-awareness. It is characterized as the application of knowledge to be able to adjust to the environment. It is also the process of applying knowledge in the proper context whenever the need arises. Intelligence is also often thought as a hereditary rather than environmental. So if both parents are intelligent, there is a great possibility that their offsprings will also be intelligent. Two things should be noted about intelligence. First, Individuals are born with innate intellectual ability that is harnessed in various contexts. And number two, intelligence is not confined in the academic context. The Howard Gardner's Theory of Multiple Intelligences poses eight areas of human intelligence. First is the verbal linguistic intelligence. It is the ability to analyze information and produce output that involves oral and written language. So if you speak persuasively and fluently about an idea, you may have this kind of intelligence. Second is mathematical logical intelligence. It is the ability to understand and answer mathematical questions. So if you are skilled at deductive reasoning, detecting patterns, and logical thinking, you may have this kind of intelligence. Third is visual spatial intelligence. It is the ability to analyze graphical information. So if you have the ability to comprehend three-dimensional images and shapes, you may have this kind of intelligence. Fourth is musical intelligence. It is the ability to produce and make meaning of different types of sounds. So if you are able to hear and recognize patterns of sounds easily, and you are sensitive to rhythm and sounds, then you may have this kind of intelligence. 
Fifth is the naturalistic intelligence. It is the ability to identify and distinguish aspects of the natural world. So if you are interested in subjects such as botany, biology, and zoology, and you enjoy camping, gardening, hiking, and exploring the outdoors, you may have this kind of intelligence. Sixth is bodily kinesthetic intelligence. It is the ability to use one's body to create products or solve problems. So if you are skilled at dancing and sports, you enjoy creating things with your hands, you have excellent physical coordination and you remember by doing rather than hearing or seeing, you may have this kind of intelligence. Seventh is the interpersonal intelligence. It is the ability to be sensitive of other people's thoughts and emotions. So if you have the ability to understand and relate to other people, and you can easily able to pick up on feelings, mood, motivations, and intentions of those around you, then you may have this kind of intelligence. Eighth and last is the intrapersonal intelligence. It is the ability for self-introspection. So if you have the ability to think in a logical way to develop strategy, plans, analysis, and solutions to problems, then you may have this kind of intelligence. Aside from Gardner's multiple intelligences theory, another theory is proposed by Robert Sternberg called the Triarchic Theory of Intelligence. According to Sternberg, Intelligence is defined as the mental activity directed toward purposive adaptation to, selection, and shaping of real-world environments relevant to one's life. Sternberg proposed three aspects of intelligence. These are componential, experiential, and contextual. Componential or analytical intelligence includes abstract thinking and logical reasoning, verbal and mathematical skills. Experiential or creative intelligence involves divergent thinking and ability to deal with novel situations. Contextual or practical intelligence, on the other hand, is the ability of being street smart. It is also the ability to apply knowledge to the real world and shape or choose an environment. Learning is defined as a relatively permanent change in a person's knowledge or behavior as a result of experience. When knowledge or information is transferred to long-term memory, which are further elaborated, rehearsed, and practice, then learning happens. People learn in many ways and several theories and models have been forwarded to understand and explain how learning occurs. One such a theory is the social cognitive theory, which emphasizes the value of social environment in one's learning process that is built on observational learning. Based on this theory, there are four stages in observational learning. First, attention. Second, retention. Third, motor reproduction. And fourth, motivation. According to the social cognitive theory, attention happens when an individual focuses on information that he or she perceives to be interesting and useful. Retention happens when an individual stores and gives a mental representation of the information. Motor reproduction happens when an individual recalls and rehearses the information given. And motivation happens when an individual repeats the entire process constantly and consistently. An example is solving a difficult mathematical problem. On the first stage, the student listens to the math teacher. On the second stage, the students read books and memorizes the formulas and principles to be used. On the third stage, he practices solving different equations. And the fourth stage, he does this over and over again to learn how to solve the mathematical problems accurately with ease. The notion of learning is underlined by notions of self-efficacy and human agency. Self-efficacy is defined as the extent to which people believe that they can confidently learn and master a particular skill. When an individual has high self-efficacy, he or she is likely to engage in challenging tasks and deal with frustrations and disappointments efficiently. In contrast, people with low self-efficacy are likely to avoid difficult tasks because they lack confidence which further contributes to them having low self-esteem. Thus, self-efficacy is a crucial factor in one's learning. And according to Albert Bandura, self-efficacy can be developed through the following. 
first mastery experience by accomplishing simple tasks that lead to more complex tasks. Second, social modeling by observing an identifiable model who accomplishes the tasks. Third, improving physical and emotional states by being relaxed and calm before pursuing a challenging task. And fourth, a verbal persuasion by providing encouragement and feedback during the accomplishment of a challenging task. An example that illustrates self-efficacy would be a learner who is doing a particularly challenging writing assignment. If the learner is already has an experience in similar tasks, looks up to a mentor, allots sufficient time to the tasks, and is constantly encouraged, he or she will probably have self-efficacy. On the other hand, facing the same situation, a learner who has no prior experience in writing, has no model to look up to, is always stressed and pressured by the deadline, and receives no positive feedback in accomplishing the task, is likely to have low self-efficacy in writing. Apart from self-efficacy, human agency is another valuable principle in learning process. People are not products of inner forces or environments. They are self-regulating and proactive. It means that people influence their own environments by their characteristics and behavior. People influence other people and they influence social groups in attaining benefits that can be experienced by many. Thus, in the learning process, students are equally accountable for their performance as much as their teachers. Although educators are largely responsible for shaping the learning process, students themselves can also take hold of their own learning process through self-regulation. There are two strategies in learning that students can use. First is deep learning and second is surface learning. In surface learning, students simply accept information presented to them and memorize them in an isolated and unlinked manner. As a result, no deep understanding of ideas and concepts and long-term retention of information is achieved. On the other hand, deep learning is the deeper understanding of information by creating significant meaningful links across different concepts and how it can be applied in practical ways. Students who engage in deep learning strategies are self-regulated learners. They practically teach themselves and engage in learning opportunities characterized by collaboration and high metacognition. In other words, surface learning leads to mere absorption of facts, and it does not allow for autonomous learning to happen. Although surface learning is useful in some instances, it should be understood that it is the type of learning that does not necessarily lead to deep understanding. On the other hand, deep learning strategies involve making meaningful connections, using higher cognitive skills, enhancing intrinsic motivations, and developing better metacognitive skills. To be able to adapt to deep learning strategies, students can engage in different habits. These habits are number one, taking down notes. By taking down notes, students reinforce the retention and comprehension of ideas and can relate them to past information they have already stored. Second is asking questions during class sessions. Asking questions during class fosters individual and group discovery through an active discussion between the teacher and students. It also allows opportunity for immediate feedback of the learning process. Third is creating cognitive maps. The essence of deep learning is a process of students and students making meaningful connections among different forms of information learned by the students. Creating cognitive maps is learning concepts together to arrive at valuable meanings and also to enable the transfer of valuable concepts to long-term memory. Fourth is engaging in collaborative learning activities with mentors and peers. In joining study groups, students can converse, exchange ideas, and debate so as to sharpen their collaborative learning skills. And fifth is going beyond the mandatory course requirements. Reading additional reference materials, watching films that showcase concepts discussed in class, going on trips for an alternative learning experience, and engaging in other learning opportunities can greatly enhance the learning process. This ends our discussion for Lesson 3. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope that you learned something significant today.